let's talk a little bit about debt valuation and interest rates. We're going to talk about the situation where a corporation uh, needs money either to expand or to pay some bills, to pay off some old debt. And uh, so they're going to issue IOUs. So there's lots of different IOUs a corporation could issue. They could go down to their local bank and have a one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one relationship with their lender and just borrow some money that way. Or they could issue publicly traded bonds. And so that way they can access the public markets, probably get a little bit lower rate, um, but maybe have a little bit higher cost because they're going to have to hire a trustee to represent the bondholders. The bonds could be senior debt of the corporation or they could be subordinated. In other words, there might be other debt of the corporation that gets paid first before these guys get paid. And in this case, in that case, then the, these bondholders would want a little bit higher rate for being subordinated to other folks. Or they might issue mortgage bonds, which means there's the bonds are secured by real estate or equipment somewhere so that if the bondholders don't get paid, they can foreclose against that collateral. Or they could be euro bonds, which is a little bit of a misnomer. Euro bonds simply means that it's paying in a currency other than the country in which it was issued. So if a U.S. corporation issues bonds in Japan and pays in U.S. dollars, those would be euro bonds. Or they could be zero coupon bonds. Those used to be popular where the company says, I'll pay you $1,000 20 years from now but they only collect, say, $100 today. And then at the end of the 20 years, they pay back the $1,000. So there's no coupon attached to the bond. The interest is just imputed from the fact that it grew from $100 to $1,000. Or if a company has a below investment grade rating, it might be issuing what are called junk bonds. In other words, the two rating agencies rate bonds from the strongest to the weakest. Anything below this red line here is called below investment grade or junk bond. Or they might be floating rate bonds. So instead of a fixed rate of 4% or 5% for 20 years, the interest rate might be uh, pegged to, say, LIBOR, the London Interbank Offering Rate, or the Prime Rate, or some kind of long-term mortgage rate, so that the rate floats up and down over time. Or the bonds might be convertible bonds. So the, bond, the, the borrower might say, hey, at some point during the life of the bonds, you can turn these bonds into common stock of our company. So uh, if a bondholder buys a fixed rate bond at 4%, they're not going to do much better than that. If interest rates go down, they can sell the bond and make a little bit of money, but there's basically a ceiling on how much money they can make. However, if it's converted to common stock, there really is no ceiling to the upside of how much money a, the investor can make. So what determines the interest rate when a bond is first issued? or for that matter, when it's traded. In other words, when a bondholder sells a bond, somebody new comes in and buys it in the secondary market, they're going to have a required rate of return, and that interest rate is going to determine the price of the bond. Well, how do we get that interest rate? Well, it comes from the real rate of interest, the real underlying cost of renting money, plus an inflation premium, an investor anticipates a certain amount of inflation over the life of the bond, plus a default premium. If the lender thinks they not, might not get paid, they're going to want a bigger premium. And then there's a maturity premium. The longer the bond is out there, the longer the investor has the risk. And so the longer that a loan is out there in time, usually the higher the interest rate that's required. This is called the yield curve. So if you borrow for five years, you pay maybe a 3% interest, but if you borrow for 30 years, you're up around a 6% interest. And that's the normal yield curve. For the most part in uh, finance class, we'll talk about a bond that pays interest twice a year. And we usually talk about a typical bond being in the $1,000 face amount. So if you had an 8% bond, that was outstanding for six years, it would pay $40 twice a year. 8% times 1,000 is 80. But since bonds typically pay interest twice a year, at the end of six months, they'd pay half of that. That's 40. Then the other half, another 40. The next year, 40, 40, etc. Until they repay the principal at the end of six years. 
And the price of a bond is very simply the present value of the future cash flows discounted at the buyer's required rate of return. So if I wanted to earn 8%, I would pay $1,000 for this bond. I would get 40, 40, 40, 40, 40. That's 8% a year, and I'd get my $1,000 back. And if we know what a bond is trading for today out in the secondary market, and we know its terms, then we can use our calculator to solve for I to find out what the buyer's required rate of return is. What discount rate did he or she use to find the present value of those future payments to pay whatever it was he or she paid for that bond? Okay, let's use our calculator to do some simple bond calculations. In these calculations, we're going to assume that we're uh, buying or selling the bond uh, right after an interest payment has been made. So what is the price of a 5% 20-year bond if the required rate of return is 5%? Well, this should be $1,000. Let's check and see. First, since all the payments are the same, we don't have to go into the CF menu. We can stay in the third row. We can stay in the third row. We can stay in the third row. So what's the end? Well, if a bond pays interest twice a year, the end for a 20-year bond must be 40. What's the I? Well, we want a required rate return of 5%. So we're going to divide that by 2 since it pays interest twice a year and put in 2.5. What are we going to get? We're going to get $25 every 6 months. That's 5% times 1,000 divided by 2. And at the end, we're going to get 1,000 bucks back. So we plug that in as a future value. We hit Compute PV, and sure enough, it's $1,000. What is the price of a 5% 20-year bond if the required rate of return is 6%? So normally we always clear in between calculations, but since everything is the same except the interest rate, let's just plug in 3 as the new required rate of return. Interest rates go up, bond prices go down, so we hit Compute PV, and sure enough the bond has gone down to a price of 884.43. If this were a 1-year bond, it wouldn't have gone down very much because the the effect of the interest rate differential between the required rate and the contract rate would only be out there for a short period of time. So the longer the bond is out there, the more susceptible it is to price changes. What is the price of a 5% 20-year bond if the required rate of return is 4%? Interest rates go down, bond prices go up. Normally we would clear everything in between calculations, but since the only thing that's changing is the interest rate, we'll plug in 2. 4 divided by 2, since it pays interest twice a year, is 2. And now we'll find the present value, and the price of the bond has gone up to $1,136.78. And don't forget, don't be worried about this negative sign. Calculator has this convention. If you put in positive numbers, you get negative numbers out. If you put in negative numbers, you get positive numbers out. And as I said before, if we know what a, a price being paid for a bond is, and we know the terms, we can figure out what the discount rate was that the buyer used. In other words, we can figure out the yield to maturity of the bond, which is the buyer's required rate of return, but will really help us if we're trying to figure out what our incremental borrowing rate is. Companies don't issue bonds every day, only every few years. And so interest rates go up and down and the company's credit rating goes up and down. If we want to know how much it would cost us to borrow money today, we can look at the price of our bonds out there in the marketplace and figure out what the buyer's required rate of return is and figure out what interest rate we would have to pay if we borrowed money today. So uh, let's clear these guys here. And it tells us that we've got a 20-year bond, so that's 40 in. It tells us that the price I'm just paid for that bond is 768.85. Let's change sign and make that a money out. They were going to receive, it's a 4% bond, so they're going to receive 20 bucks twice a year, and they're going to get $1,000 at the end of the uh, 20 years. So now we'll just compute I. We'll multiply that times 2, and it'll tell us that our required rate of, the buyer's required rate of return is 6%. So if we had to borrow money today, we'd have to uh, pay 6% interest. All right, what happens if we sell a bond in between uh, interest payment dates? Well, then you'd have to go into the bond menu. And there you put in the settlement date, you put in the coupon rate on the bond, you put in the redemption date, you tell the calculator whether you get 100% of face value, which you always do at the end. You tell it whether to use actual days over 365 or 360 over 
30 over 360 and whether you pay interest once a year or twice a year. That bond menu is far beyond the scope of this video, but you should know that it's out there and it'll help you do calculated, uh, complicated bond calculations if you buy and sell a bond in between interest periods. In the meantime, the whole point of this topic today is that the price somebody should pay for a bond is the present value of the future cash flows discounted at their required rate of return. Hope that helps.